diagram, which is from the NCMA guide, provides a section through a typical geogrid reinforced wall. As we've already discussed in SRWs 101, there are different structure types such as gravity, multi-depth, crib, and geogrid reinforced. The most common method of wall construction is probably the geogrid reinforced approach, as it is typically the most cost effective for walls higher than four or five feet. The NCMA design manual and best practice guide really focuses on geogrid reinforced walls more than any other because they are the most common and also they require the most guidance to build properly. We can use this diagram as a kind of guide to look at each aspect of the wall. So starting from the ground up, let's first understand the different soil zones. Underneath the wall is the foundation soil as we discussed. Foundation soil is the native earth or engineered fill that supports the entire structure. The bearing capacity is the geotechnical term used to describe the strength of the soil or load carrying capacity. In some cases, particularly for higher walls where the weight of the wall is significant, the native ground may not be strong enough. It could be a layer of loose fill or organic layer or a weak layer of native soil. Regardless, we must remove it and replace it. The question is, how do we do this? Many new to wall construction think that in a geogrid reinforced wall, the facing alone makes up the quote unquote wall. So the first thought is to support this facing. However, this is an incorrect assumption. In a grid reinforced wall, the entire mass of the wall includes the facing as well as the reinforced zone. If the entire wall is not supported, the reinforced zone can settle relative to the facing and cause the geogrids to potentially tear away from the back of the block and potentially fail. To replace the foundation soil down to competent ground, we must excavate the weak layer, then compact high quality imported gravel or approved engineered fill material in 8-inch lifts under the direction of the geotechnical engineer. The weight of the wall does not travel straight down through the soil, but actually is distributed at an angle of about 45 degrees. As a result, we have to make sure that this fill zone below the wall extends out in front of the wall and behind the wall, at least at a distance equal to the depth. The next soil zone is the reinforced soil. In a typical geogrid reinforced wall, the reinforced zone accounts for between 60 to 90 percent of the total structure. So it's a critical component. As mentioned earlier, the NCMA does allow the use of native soils in the reinforced zone, but even these materials must meet minimum standards. The preferred approach is to use imported, well-graded gravels, mainly because they allow water to drain and have good strength parameters. Soils in general are classified according to the particle size. So something like a gravel would be around 80 millimeters or around three inches down to about five millimeters or a quarter inch. Sands range from that quarter inch down to about 75 microns, which is barely visible. Smaller than this, and we get into what are called fine grain soils, such as clay and silt. These so soils hold water and their strength can vary greatly based on the amount of water present. This is why the reinforced zone must limit use of this type of fine grain soil. To summarize, the preferred reinforced soil is a well graded sand gravel mixture with a maximum of 8% fine grain material. More than 8% fines and we need to include additional drainage layers. If native materials are being considered, the NCMA allows up to 35% fine grain soils such as clays and silts. The issue with using native soils is always going to be consistency. Can we reliably assume that the material that is excavated from one bank or cut is the same as that excavated from another? Will the cost of ensuring this outweigh the cost of just importing a known material? When using native soils, there's a lot to consider. First, you're required to construct a drainage layer immediately behind the blocks and separate this from the native material, all while ensuring compaction meets the specifications. This is easy to draw on paper, but difficult to do properly in the field. Believe me, it doesn't end up looking anything like this nice picture. So using native materials with a drainage layer adds another level of complexity, which always has a cost or creates the opportunity to get it wrong. At Reese Stone, we promote simplicity to reduce variability. 
simplicity in products, construction, and tools to reduce the potential of someone making a mistake. So in terms of pros and cons, the obvious pro of using native materials is that the material may be less expensive or even free depending on the site. However, the cons can be substantial. From a construction point of view, as mentioned, it's difficult and time-consuming to construct the drainage layer for starters. Also, soils with a high percentage of fine grain materials are much more difficult to control, in particular compacting them and maintaining an optimum water content. This can make construction in cold or wet weather almost impossible. Finally, the short and long-term performance of this type of material is less predictable and the strength properties of fine grain soils will vary with the presence of water. From a design point of view, using native materials usually result in longer geogrid lengths and more layers due to the decrease in soil strength. In terms of quality control, the geotechnical engineer will likely need to conduct more testing and increase their on-site presence to feel comfortable that the native soil is continually meeting the specification. This all costs money, which is the bottom line. When you add up the additional costs associated with using native material, is it really a better alternative? So here's a little quiz. What is wrong with this drainage layer? I will give you a few seconds to think about it. Well, it should be pretty obvious. Um, pretty much everything. You've got a contaminated drainage layer, uh, no separation from the backfill material, an inconsistent incons depth of material, and basically it's not really doing what it should. this picture, what do you think the main cause of the failure is? There are a number of things that were not done right here, but the trigger is almost always water. In this case, you can see that snow was piled above the wall here during the winter, and in the spring, the reinforced zone of the wall would have been saturated. Hydrostatic pressure is built up because the reinforced zone contained a high fine content, and the earth pressure exceeded the block grid connection capacity. This wall did have a face drain, but was not properly separated, and I believe it had some fines as well. But realistically, even if the drainage layer was con constructed properly, it probably would not have made a difference. If a non-free draining material is used in the reinforced zone and there's a significant source of water, such as a broken pipe or a pile of melting snow like in this case, or unknown groundwater flow, this drainage layer will likely not protect the wall. If the reinforced zone becomes saturated, it will lose strength before the drainage layer even has time to do its job. In fact, it is not commonly known that the main purpose of this gravel layer at the face is actually to prevent settlement behind the block. High quality gravels compact very well and experience very little settlement, while native soils with fine grain content will, will settle a little bit more after construction. As a result, this gravel layer right behind the block prevents the geogrids from being pulled down immediately behind the block. Although called a drainage layer, it really is more of a transition layer to transition the geogrid from the block to the reinforced zone. Therefore, we prefer pure gravel backfills. When possible, we feel it's always better to use free draining, well graded sand gravel mixture with 8% fines. Just as a side note, the term well graded refers to the range of particle sizes in the gravel. If a soil is well graded, it means that there are all different particle sizes ranging from three inches down to fines with everything in between. This gradation allows the small particles to fill in the small voids, medium particles to fill in medium voids, and so on. As a result, you get a very dense interlocked soil structure which makes it very strong. An example of this would be a material called CA6, as shown here. You can see that a well-graded material has a portion of the material in each of the different sieve sizes. The number 200 sieve, shown on the far right, is the fine content. You can see that some materials have no fines at all. This would be like a number 57 stone. You could also backfill the reinforced zone with this type of material, particularly in situations um, where there's a, a lot of water. In contrast to using native soils, imported gravel does not require an additional drainage layer or transition layer. 
It is easier to handle in different weather and has predictable performance. From a design perspective, high quality gravel sand fill will, will require less geogrid and likely less quality control. Whether imported gravel or native materials are being used, compaction of the reinforced zone is critical. The strength of a geogrid reinforced wall lies in the quality and density of the backfill material in the reinforced zone. The strength properties we assume about the soil and the design are directly related to how well it is compacted. Regardless of the type of soil being used, if it is not compacted to the specifications, it will not meet the strength criteria. Proper compaction also reduces settlement to the reinforced zone. The NCMA recommends only hand-operated vibratory compaction equipment should be used within three feet or one meter of the back of the wall. The thickness of the layers that are compacted or the lift thickness should not exceed eight inches and should be verified regularly by a geotechnical engineer. The geotech uses a device called the nuclear densometer which measures the compaction. Typically, we specify the compaction to be 95% standard proctor density, a term which we'll, we'll discuss a bit more later. A drainage outlet system must be provided to remove any water within the reinforced zone. Depending on the situation, there are two options available to outlet the drain system. In some cases, a catch basin or other underground collection system may not be available, so you can outlet the drain pipe through the face of the wall as shown here. A perforated flexible rigid PVC pipe is used to run along the back of the wall units. The perforations are typically only on one side of this pipe and should be placed in the down position. This pipe then connects with a T connection to a rigid non-perforated PVC pipe. This should be fitted with a rodent guard and both pipes are typically four inches in diameter. Below the perforated pipe is recommended to compact a less permeable engineered fill material to catch water percolating down so that it can be collected before continuing further below. Other options exist as well that do not require cutting the blocks or parging to fill in gaps as shown here. If sig significant water is anticipated, scour protection below the outlet locations is a good idea as shown here on this great Sonoma Stone project in Ontario. When there is a positive outlet, such as a catch basin, within proximity to the wall, you can run the perforated drain at the lowest location, just behind the gravel leveling pad. Outlet locations must be determined in advance to ensure the length of pipe without an outlet is not run in excessive distance. The NCMA recommends venting at 100 foot or 30 meter intervals. This is an example of a drainage system almost failing. This is a Sonoma Stone project where the drainage system was failing, so water built up behind the face of the wall. Sonoma has weeping channels in the top of the blocks, so water flowed through the face, which relieved the pressure until these channels froze up, plugging them as you can see. The hydrostatic pressure continued to build, causing some bulging in the face. Next, we will take a look at geogrid reinforcements. These are the layers of high strength mesh that are placed at regular intervals within the reinforced mass. As mentioned previously, these layers act like steel in reinforced concrete, providing tensile resistance within the mass. As a side note, to demonstrate how effective geogrids are in holding together a mass, this test wall was constructed by the Federal Highway Administration in the United States. It is near vertical and does not have any facing block. The geogrids are tightly spaced in, in this example. Over time, the material of the face would erode away, so a block would be necessary long term, but it does show how impressive this technology is. When installing geogrids, there are a few critical guidelines to follow. First, the proper type and strength of geogrid must be in accordance with the design. There's no such thing as an acceptable substitute unless it has been verified and approved by the SRW design engineer. Just because a similar geogrid may have the same tensile strength, it may not have the same connection properties or interaction properties with the reinforcement soil. When installing the geogrids, they must be placed within one inch from the face of the block. This ensures proper block geogrid connection. Also, the backfill material must be compacted right up to the top of the block so the geogrid lays horizontally out behind the block and does not drop down. 
If the backfill is not level, the geogrid will be pulled down over the back of the block under tremendous weight, which we have seen cause the geogrid to tear if sharp edges exist. A common mistake that new contractors make is to roll the geogrid out along the length of the wall. This is wrong. There are two problems with this. Number one, the rolled direction is the strong direction in the mesh, and we want to go perpendicular to the wall face to act as a tieback. The other dimension, known as the cross machine direction, is substantially weaker. The other problem with this is that the roll comes in set width, such as 4 feet or 6 feet. The length of geogrid required by the design can be anything based on the wall height, loading, and so on. So the roll must be cut to length according to the design and placed in the strong direction perpendicular to the face. Once the geogrid is cut to length, adjacent pieces of geogrid should not overlap or be gapped. They should be placed right next to each other. Geogrid is only effective if it is in tension. Slack or loose geogrid layers will continue to allow soil to move until they go into tension, <clears throat> which means the wall will move. To maintain tension while backfilling, the reinforced soil should be dumped at the front, behind the, the block facing, then raked toward the back of the geogrids. Keep in mind that contractors should not stack more than two or three courses of wall before backfilling. Another effective way of ensuring geogrids remain in tension during construction is to stake them at the back, at least temporarily, until the backfill is placed and compacted. The NCMA Best Practice Guide provides recommendations for placing geogrid in special conditions. For example, for inside corners, the NCMA recommends extending the geogrid a distance equal to h over 4, or the height divided by 4, beyond the corner location as shown. For outside corners, the NCMA recommends a minimum of 3 inches of soil between overlapping layers. For inside curves, if more than 20 degree gap exists between layers, additional reinforcement should be placed. As walls are typically weaker at outside corner and outside curve locations, these recommendations are important to follow. Here's a nice example of what not to do when installing geogrid reinforcements. In this case, the contractor did not tension the geogrid. They did also not ensure the backfill is level with the block, so a large void exists under the geogrids, which will result in the down drag effect when fill is placed on top of it, putting substantial stress on the geogrid, potentially rupturing it. <clears throat> the geogrids are also gapped by about 6 inches, and the backfill is not complete, compacted properly. Coming to the top of the wall, a final important detail is how the surface water is managed. We want to ensure water is not directed into the back of the wall, but rather carried away via surface drainage system like a swale. Here are two swale details as provided in the NCMA best practice guide. The first is a concrete swale, basically four inches of concrete or asphalt lining underlain by a geotextile and supported on gravel fill. There is also a bond break such as fiberboard between the concrete and the cap unit. Below this, a swale is constructed using 4 inches of low permeability clay soil with 4 inches of topsoil and vegetation. This is probably the best natural option possible, if possible. Note that I use the word constructed when describing the swale. This is because this feature is a structural element designed to act as a pipe to carry water for the life of the structure. It is not some topsoil that is hastily mounded up behind the wall. This raises an important point that applies to many areas of wall construction. If your contractor does not get the planting contract, either above or below the wall, they must ensure that they protect their wall and discuss with the owner or project manager how overlapping elements, such as a swale, are being dealt with. We have seen situations where the contractor, the wall contractor, did not get the softscaping on a project, and the wall is left with no grading or water management above it for months leading to infiltration and damage. At the end of the day, the contractor must understand that even if certain elements around the wall are not within their scope, it is still their wall, and whether it is their fault or not, they will get dragged into it if there's a problem. So it makes most sense to address these issues well in advance. Put in the contract bid 
something that includes the construction of the swale or at least covering three feet back from the top of the wall. This will help avoid issues and finger pointing. In this picture we see a situation where no swale was constructed and in fact there's a depression in the soil here. With this setup, water will continue to infiltrate, creating pressure and frost action against the back of the top few courses of wall. This will slowly push the top of the wall out and create an even bigger space for water to penetrate. And so the cycle continues. Bottom line, the finishing details in a wall are just as important as the main construction and the contractor must take accountability for them. Another example of this is the implementation of handrails or fences above a wall. This is a classic finishing detail that can cause major issues if not planned for in advance and accounted for in the design. For smaller hand placed blocks such as Pisa 2, a pedestrian guard or handrail must be placed behind the wall in a footing such as a concrete filled sauna tube. It cannot be mounted directly on top of the wall. As mentioned, this has to be planned for in the original wall design and construction sequence. The sauna tube should be placed as the wall is constructed. When encountering geobrid layers near the top of the wall, the geobrid must be cut down the center line of the sauna tube and wrapped around it, not cut, to fit it, cut out to fit it. Reinforced material must then be well compacted around the fence footing to ensure stability. We often see this being left to the end, and the contractor attempts to auger through the geogrid to place the sauna tube after the wall is built usually resulting in geogrid becoming wrapped around the auger and pulled out of the wall face. Again, just an unnecessary headache and costly mistake. One of the major advantages of machine place walls is the ability to mount handrails directly to the top of the wall. These must be non-wind bearing fences such as chain link or picket as shown here. This detail when done properly provides a clean finished look to the wall and creates more usable space behind it. Careful attention must be given to the installation process when core drilling a handrail into a machine place wall unit. Due to the relatively high building code pedestrian handrail loading requirements, even for a large block such as Sienna Stone, the post must be core drilled down at least three units, which is approximately, approximately 22 inches in depth. To secure the post, the contractor must ensure to use the proper grout, which is a non-shrink grout, and follow the manufacturer's directions. Otherwise, if water gets into the hole between the post and the block, the results can be disastrous. This is an example of not using a non-shrink grout. A thin layer of water penetrated between the hole and the post, which then froze, expanded, and cracked the blocks. We discussed how finishing details can become the biggest problem, and this is a good example. The contractor spent the same amount of energy and resources doing it wrong as he would have doing it right. He just didn't know. Emphasizing and discussing these types of details with your contractors creates opportunities to help them avoid issues and continue being successful and makes your involvement with them more valuable. Just as an aside, every time we see one of these failures, it seems to be a square post in a round hole. It could be the stress concentrations at the corners or something else, but this always seems to be the case. For solid fences that are wind bearing, we typically recommend always founding them in large sauna tubes behind the wall, regardless of the wall system being used. The fence act essentially acts as a massive sail and can generate thousands of pounds of outward force. Even when placed behind the wall, the SRW designer must account for the wind loads in the upper layers of geogrid, so again, it cannot be an afterthought and must be included in the original design and construction sequence. In special situations, we can design the wall to handle a solid fence, but this is costly to do and requires custom brackets, dowels with high strength epoxy or grout, and considerable time. Another aspect of wall construction that the NCMA provides guidelines on is the allowable movement or deviation from the planned alignments on the wall. These are obviously in place to ensure proper construction, but they can also be looked at as a protection for the contractor. The industry is stating that these controls are acceptable for a safe structure. So if a situation arises where one stakeholder in the process does not like the way the wall looks, for example, there is something solid that the contractor can refer to to defend the installation. 
This type of education provides another opportunity to support the contractor and add value when a difficult situation arises. The vertical control is how much the wall can deviate from the planned vertical alignment, and the NCMA states that it is one and a quarter inches over 10 feet. The horizontal control is how much deviation can occur over the length of the wall, and again is a one and a quarter inches over 10 feet. Furthermore, the wall batter can deviate two degrees from the original design batter. To visualize this, this better, uh, this diagram shows the actual wall alignment as, as measured in the field following construction, which is shown in the blue, in comparison to the planned alignment in red. For vertical control, using a distance of 10 feet, these two lines cannot deviate more than one and a quarter inches. Finally, we will take a look at some additional details. SRWs are very flexible structures and can accommodate many other types of structures into them. Large stormwater pipes can be outlet through the face of the wall as shown here. This picture was taken some years ago and we have since adopted a different method when working with the civil engineer where a concrete collar is formed around the pipe so the wall can abut to it with square edges and maintain a tight fit. The key point here is that the pipes need to be designed to withstand the entire weight of the wall as SRWs cannot span any distance without support. Quite often our project requires high walls relatively close to property lines, which may provide enough space for geogrid, however, for safe, safe excavation and working conditions, temporary shoring may be required. This is a perfect example of why becoming involved in a project early on can save headaches down the road and costly surprises. In this case, Reese Stone worked with the civil engineer starting from the feasibility stages and identified the space limitation. As such, unlike other projects we have seen, a civil design did not go out to tender with a proposed design that is basically impossible to build while maintaining safe working conditions. Once you're familiar with the space requirements of a typical SRW, this is something that can be easily pointed out by a territory manager when reviewing a plan with the engineer or contractor. This picture shows how we designed the wall to incorporate geogrid that was wrapped around the rakers used to support the shoring. The final wall turned out to be another successful project due to the coordination and planning between the designers and Reese Stone. When working with an, early, an engineer early on in the process, we always try to keep other obstructions such as catch basins, utilities, or large trees outside the reinforced zone but sometimes we don't always get our way and have to deal with them. We have developed a range of solutions over the years to deal with many of these common obstructions. Some are outlined in the installation guides and some are included in our internal detail library. Finally, one of the most common issues we deal with is the use of traffic barriers immediately behind the wall. For main roadways and highways it is not usually a problem as there is typically room for a flexible steel beam guide rail. In this case, we need at least three feet from the face of the wall to the guide rail. And the guide rail must be found at least five feet deep, and we must account for the crash loads in the design. Even if there is limited room, we can accommodate a reinforced concrete barrier with a moment slab, as shown here. Where we run into most issues is the gray area, such as parking lots, private roadways, or driveways, and so on. It's not always clear what type of barrier is required. Is it a high curb, a full barrier? It seems to vary quite a bit. However, we need to emphasize to the civil engineers and architects that SRWs cannot act as a curb or barrier by sticking one or two courses up above grade. I see this all the time, and as a result, I see it in practice around parking lots, malls, etc., where the top block is being pushed off. This is not a good detail and designers must account for the additional space needed for a barrier early on in their design. That wraps up our section on SRW construction. We have gone through the basic aspects of SRW construction, however, there is much more for all of us to learn.